Chairman, and thank you to the organising committee for uh, inviting my group to be able to present our results from this crossbreeding study that we conducted back in 2014 through to 2016, I think it was. Uh, I must also apologise because, quite obviously, I'm not Joe Coombe, the leading <laughs> author of this uh, paper and the one that managed the project for those two years. Unfortunately, Joe could not be here in Japan with us. Many of my Australian colleagues to date, uh, and some of you will have seen slides that they presented showing a little bit about Australia, the Australian dairy industry, and rather than repeat some of that information, I thought I would cut basically to the chase here and talk about the background to our study, except to re-emphasise that Australia is a pasture-based uh, dairy industry in the main, uh, with uh, increasing dependence on uh, concentrates, but um, we still have extensive in have an extensive industry. The background to this study is that, uh, like many of the uh, industries around the world, our industry is dominated by the Holstein Frisian, uh, and it, those genetics uh, arose from North America in the main. That has resulted in a, a huge increase in productivity as the proportion of our overseas genetics has increased through, um, through AI programs. And from the farmer's benefit, it's led to uh, genetic selection for things like angularity and milk yield and um, uh, dairy character. But it's had an associated, and people recognise this around the world, of course, decline in uh, fairly important traits of health, fertility and survival. And this has led naturally to decreases in profitability uh, and uh, in many cases some dairy farmers despairing about their future. So, why was the study done? Uh, Crossbreeding has been considered in some parts of the world as a solution to this fertility issue. And uh, along with a study I conducted back in the early 2000s and uh, other studies in America, we have been able to show that uh, crossbreeding may be a way of reversing the, uh, de this decline in fertility. Uh, a survey I conducted as part of that research showed that Although farmers were interested in crossbreeding in Australia, they realised it could help them. They were still reluctant to adopt the process of crossbreeding as such. So we established through this uh, survey that one of the main issues for farmers was where do they go after that first cross, whatever the breeds might be. Uh, and to explain what we thought was uh, two rational ways of dealing with uh, that question, uh, which I'm sure those who have worked with crossbred animals before will understand. But uh, on the left here, this model shows a two-breed cross. And uh, although I, my colourblind issues, I think that's yellow uh, and that's blue. Um, which I, have, I, I didn't obviously draw these slides up, so I, I, have, I wouldn't have used that colour, uh, which I can't recognise. Uh, this is a typical two-way cross, where if we say that's a Holstein, that's a Jersey, our first cross becomes a, a combination of the two parental breeds, and uh, there are advantages of that uh, cross. And then what farmers were concerned about, what do you do with that animal? And the most typical way of dealing with it was, is a flip-flop system whereby you then back cross with a Holstein in this case and then in the next generation a Jersey and so on and so on. The issue with that is that heterosis eventually equilibrates at about 67% and you lose some of that advantage that you've tried to gain through crossbreeding. On the right we have perhaps a, a newer system to the dairy industry, but a very true and tried method in other food producing industries such as pork and chicken, and that's a three breed cross. 
The problem in Australia is that third breed has not been sufficiently uh, represented in, in numbers to, to allow it until we believe very recently. But the mechanics of the three breed cross are, again, if we have a Holstein and a Jersey to produce our first cross, we then go to a third breed, which uh, is, uh, in a, varies around the world, but in our hands tends to be an Australian red. And then you put, go back to your original Holstein over that generation and so on, uh, Jersey and then another Australian red or whichever the third breed is. And the advantage of that process is that heterosis uh, colorates out at about 87%. So the advantage of crossbreeding is therefore much more than uh, gains in, in that model, uh, are much greater than in the two breed cross. Whoops. My apologies. I have heavy fingers. So we came up with our study questions uh, using data that we were going to collect on uh, production, cell count and uh, reproduction and of course survival. We needed to frame our basic uh, study questions which uh, were, as you see there, where, we sh where should we go after the first cross? But more importantly, does a back cross or a three breed strategy perform better? Which of the two performs better? Um, and along the way, we would also establish how much crossbreeding was going on in Australia, including the number of uh, three breeds, herds, which was uh, important for us to establish. So where did we get the data? Uh, Australia has an organisation called the Australian Dairy Herd Information Service, which uh, is now known as Data Gene. Um, but that collects herd recording data from all over Australia. And we were able to interrogate their database and established a large number of, uh, were able to access a large number of lactations, huge number of cows, and a large number of farms. And this makes it what we believe to be the biggest look at crossbreeding uh, undertaken to date. Now, the study, and I'm sorry for a slide like that, uh, in a hall this size, uh, it becomes very difficult to interpret, but it's important that it's there because one of the things we had to establish was how, each, how we would classify each herd that we were going to analyse. Uh, so without worrying too much about the detail in the flow chart, what we've done is uh, establish rules to understand what each herd was in each year of the, of the study. And we developed uh, boxes which, were, which we categorised them into as either three breed, two breed, uh, and we <laughs> differentiated between serious and not serious. And we don't need to worry too much about that at the moment for this uh, presentation. And the purebred. So we were basically trying to work out how many three breed herds there were and what they were, where they were which were two breed herds and which were pure breed herds. And from there we developed another very complicated slide. And again, for someone who's colour blind, this is challenging, I can assure you. But I will try and work you through it. Uh, for those of you who have normal vision, I'm sure it's, it'll be much easier. So down the bottom here we have the, the, eight, the years of the study from 1990 to 2013 and the total percent up this axis. Uh, the blue colour represents the purebreds over that period of time. So the, the herds that we classified as purebreds, you can see wobble around, decrease slightly over that period, but not too much. These red ones are the, uh, perhaps an interesting finding. They represents, represent herds that were fiddling around with uh, crossbreeding. That is, they would perhaps do their first generation, first cross cows, and then decide to go back to purebred. And they 
There was a, a bit of a spike early in the 1990s and then slowly they've dropped right off. The green lines represent the two breed crosses and they wobble around a bit, but basically since uh, things got going here in the mid-90s, uh, crossbreeding with two breed crosses has been fairly consistent. The interesting finding for us was though this purple, these purple lines here, which represent the three breed crosses. And as you can see uh, in Australia, uh, they've slowly increased and are on the increase as we talk today. And that was interesting to us because we were unsure of how many f farms were actually going the whole hog and using the three breeds. That gave us, which is also much against uh, what the data in the uh, industry says, that gives us a, a much larger proportion of crossbred animals to purebred animals. So the number of results. Um, and uh, what we did initially was compare the first cross cows, and in this case, the Jersey Holstein Friesian, so that's a Jersey sire over a Holstein Friesian cow, and we compared them to the parent pure breed, uh, in, in this case, the Holstein Friesian. We looked at all combinations, Holstein Friesian over Jersey, we looked at Jersey uh, compared to Jersey, etc. But these were the significant numbers of cows to allow this study um, to uh, produce some interesting results. This table really has been repeated in many studies around the world, much smaller than ours uh, because of uh, numbers of cows used, but it illustrates the fact that the purebred still out produces the first cross cow in literage and in fat, uh, sorry, in protein, but not in fat or protein percent or fat percent. Likewise, the reproduction of these uh, first cross animals compared to the purebred Holstein Friesian, significant improvement in reproduction uh, performance, um, which we measured th through a three week submission rate, first service conception rate, and our primary measure of reproductive performance that we use in Australia is called the six weeks in calf rate which is the percentage of the herd that gets in calf during the first six weeks of mating, uh, which is very important in a seasonal or split system of calving. Uh, the only non-significant result was the non-pregnance non at 12 weeks. But these results have been repeated, as I say, in other studies around the world and in my original study that I conducted back in the 2000s, early 2000s. Where it got interesting is the three breed cross and we compared three breed cross to uh, the back cross. So the Josie Holstein Friesian back cross to the Holstein. And uh, the significance there is that uh, the back, the three breed cross produced more milk, uh, sorry, l l slightly less milk, but better components. And in the reproduction side, uh, it produced, um, Interesting results, on balance, reproduction was better for the three breed cross. There was significant improvement in first service conception rate, in our six week in calf rate, but not so much in uh, submission rate or not in calf rate. So in summary, what we want to tell the farmers is that Holstein Friesian purebreds perform better than two breed crossbreds for milk volume, a fact that we've known for some time, I guess. Two breed crossbreds outperform the Holstein Friesian purebreds for components, survival, and three week submission rate. But the most important thing that we've derived from this study was that the Holstein Friesian cross Australian red, and we chose the Australian red as our third breed because. In Australia, we have very few other breeds, well, in numbers enough to make this analysis work. The Australian red, there are sufficient numbers. And uh, for those who wonder what an Australian red is, it's a der derivation of the Scandinavian red. Um, but the, the Holstein Friesian cross, Australian Jersey cross, Australian red, 
three breed outperformed the back cross for most measures. So how are we going to extend these messages? Um, what we are now going to say on behalf of Dairy Australia, it's better to use a three breed rotational system using the Australian red breed than a back cross system using two parent breeds. Of course, it goes without saying we need to use high genetic merit size to maximise results. I would like to acknowledge my fellow authors and uh, thank you for your attention today. Thank you.